All right, so thanks for joining for uh, the 12th annual Denver Startup Week. Um, we want to thank our title sponsors, Amazon, Capital One Cafe, Dell for Startups, and the Downtown Denver Partnership. The session is part of the People Track, as you all mostly know since you're here, um, sponsored by the Com Commons on Champa, one of eight programming tracks supporting the entire entrepreneurial teams. So by attending this session, you are agreeing to our code of conduct, as well as being to being photographed and potentially recorded um, on video. So make sure you are sharing your experience online with hashtag Den Startup Week and hashtag The Working Well, which is my company. <laughs> so we'll get into that. Okay, so these are our sponsors a little bit more in depth. So thank you so much to all of our sponsors for having this opportunity to put this on for everybody. And more. All right, so here's our agenda today. We are gonna go over um, some general guidelines for today, AKA housekeeping um, items. We'll do a short centering meditation to get us all present and, and centered to be here today together. I'll introduce myself. I want to hear from a couple of you who you are. And we'll get into the top challenges that managers and employees experience and the missing link and what that is. I'll share my story and how I'm connected to hidden differences and the five pillars to creating collaborative and productive work teams. And then at the end, We'll have time for question and answers, and I'm always happy to stay after to talk more after our session time is over. Okay, so I want you to, to start off knowing that this presentation is for you. I'm here to share my knowledge and answer questions, so please speak up if you have questions. This is, this is for you to learn. And so what that means also is participation by choice. You can participate by raising your hand, speaking out loud, or just silently reflecting, taking notes on your own, and that's your form of participation. There's no expectation either way, and I'm really happy that you're all here either way. If you need to take a break and use the restroom, you can go through this door right here at any point in time. It's locked on the outside, so you have to come back through and around. Um, or just for you know, sensory -ish reasons, you wanna take a break, please do so, that's, that's welcome here. All right, so research shows that 40% of the time in meetings we're distracted. So we're gonna take a few minutes to center and presence ourselves so that we hopefully reduce that number for the next hour. And participation is optional, as I said before, with the entire uh, presentation today. So if pr meditation and deep breaths feels like something you want to participate in, let's do it. If you're like, nope, that's not me, cool, you can just watch us. <laughs> All right, so if it feels good for you, I invite you to take your feet down onto the ground. Get a comfortable seat in your chair, maybe wiggle around a little bit. Until you feel really grounded and centered, maybe you move forward, maybe you move backward, until you find the center of your chair and your seat beneath you. If it feels good, you can close down your eyes, maybe soften your gaze or look downward gently. Pick up all 10 toes, spread them out wide. Press each toe back down into your shoe. Feel your whole foot pressing into the ground. Bring your attention up your calves, into the back of your legs into your seat and your hips, and feel the chair and the floor beneath you holding you steady. You don't need to do anything, it's always gonna be there. Move your attention into your belly, the back of your spine. Feel yourself begin to lift up tall. Lift your chest, open it wide. Deep breath into your back, feel your back get larger broader, soften your shoulders, bring your breath up your throat. And let's take a minute to focus and stay on our throat. 
We'll begin to focus on your exhales, relaxing any constriction you feel in your throat. And on your inhales, fill up big, open up your throat. And exhale, relax 5% more maybe, any constriction in your throat. We'll do one more just like that. Inhale, get broad and wide. And exhale, relax. We'll gently begin to open your eyes. And we'll use this newfound openness in our throat to invite an open and engaging conversation today. So, I, uh, my company is called The Working Well, where I help mission-driven companies improve their team cohesion through teaching leadership skills specifically designed to support neurodiversity and invisible disabilities. So when we talk about mission, I'm, what I mean by that is companies that are really in their daily work, their daily actions, moving the needle forward on impacting their community in a positive way, our, our teams within the workforce in a positive way. So who feels like you work in a mission-driven organization? Awesome. Does anyone want to share their mission? Yeah, in the back. Where everyone can love work. Ooh, nice. You're in the right place. I, a lot of us probably have similar <laughs> values. Yeah. Uh, we believe businesses create community change, and so business development should be affordable for everybody. Thanks, Jesse. <laughs> we work with companies to expand their view of disability inclusion. Great. Amazing. Me too. <laughs> All right. So a little bit about me that I shared about my company, now about me. I am Jen, again, and I have a bachelor's in psychology and a master's in organizational leadership where I focus on health and wellness and that's effect on leadership ability. And I also am a yoga and mindfulness teacher and survivor of multiple brain injuries. So this last one is not how I typically introduce myself at parties or happy hours, but it's you know, relevant here, as you could probably imagine. And it's what brought me here to do this work. So I'll tell you more about my journey, how I overcame those challenges when we, when we get a little bit deeper. OK, so what are the challenges that managers experience that I know that I can help with that are specifically related to team cohesiveness? I feel like I should say cohesion. I like that better. <laughs> Productivity and employee longevity. First, we have the unnerving feeling that micromanaging is the only way to get stuff done. Anyone felt that before? Who can relate? Do you ever spend excess time and money on you know, doing your onboarding process and, and micromanaging and, and feeling like you can never kind of let go? Having defensive or, de or um, disengaged employees. This is something that I felt a lot in my, my previous team. Oh, these all say one. <laughs> I edited it to put it into the Denver Startup Week t template, and that's what happened. Oh, well, that's fine. You guys can count. So employees expressing that their needs aren't being prioritized. Who's felt that as an employee? I, I think everyone's nodding their head right now. Yeah. Employees performing at lower productivity levels or than expected or quiet quitting. Maybe you've been the manager feeling that from your employees or maybe you've been that employee. If, especially if your needs aren't being prioritized or being met, why are you going to put in the extra work to, to you know, do more than the bare minimum? And then lastly, a constant cycle of surprise resignations followed by replacement hiring and onboarding. This is, is really frustrating and it was really big during the pandemic, too, as I'm sure you all can relate to. And so not only is it just kind of suck when a lot of people leave and we have this turnover, but also it's expensive. 
So these studies show that around 90 to 100 percent of an employee's yearly salary is the turnover cost for an average employee. And then when you look at higher level executives, that can go up to 250 percent of the employee's salary. That's really high. So not only is it affecting our morale and productivity, it's also affecting our bottom line and our finances. So how have these issues affected you and your team? Who wants to share? Maybe you can talk about a, a role that you're currently in or a previous role. Sometimes you might be here with a coworker and maybe you don't want to talk about your current role. <laughs> Has anyone experienced any of these? And I'll go back so you can look at all of them. All the ones. Mm -hmm. And then what? Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of, you know, it, it can tend to lead to doubt. They say, am I in the right place? Right. Go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So when, when people leave, it affects the morale of who's left. They might have really enjoyed their job and start to wonder, oh, is there something I'm not seeing? Am I in the right place? Yeah. So I've worked for the same company for 22 years, and I've watched a lot of that quiet quitting and a lot of people that feel like their needs aren't being prioritized. They're bringing in people. It's a vicious cycle of, you know, constant turnover. And the veterans feel like we're being leaned on so hard because there's so much turnover across the board, and it's exhausting to the people that have stuck it out, and they're actively always looking for other places to go. Yeah. And you have all that knowledge of everything, so people turn to you a lot. That's a lot of pressure. And you're probably doing a lot more than your expected workload to keep up with all of that. Yeah. Uh, I worked for uh, Starbucks about a year ago. And I only worked there for a few months. But after, I think, five months, I was the eldest employee that stayed there. <laughs> that turnover rate was so low. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I don't know if you all could hear, after five months, he was the eldest employee. Jesse. I think one of the things we don't talk about too with that is like, when you're in that situation as an employee, your home life ends up being really lousy too. Like I spent most of the pandemic living with two people who met all of those criteria. <laughs> and that was lousy for me. <laughs> yeah. You know, like that's hard. It's hard on the people who are experiencing it. It's hard on everybody around them in their lives. Yeah. And <laughs> And um, when you're in that situation and you come home and you're complaining about work all day, you know, my husband is in the room and he's probably nodding his head back there like, yup, she complained a lot. <laughs> yeah. Being afraid to talk to HR about certain things that you need as an employee with a disability, mm -hmm. worrying that if you say something, you're going to get fired. Yeah, it can be really scary and intimidating to talk to HR and, and not know, you know what's, what's okay for me to say, what's, you know, I don't want to, anyone to look at me differently. Um, yeah, last one. I was in a scenario where I took over an operation where this was going on, and it was startling to me how long it took to change. Like oh, yeah. Once, once I told people it was okay to fail, it was okay to make mistakes, they were still afraid for like the next 18 months, so it was... This has a lasting impact. Change is hard and it takes time. And even when it's a positive change, people are kind of scared of it because it's unfamiliar. Yeah, this is great. Uh, we'll have more opportunities for discussion. So if you didn't get a chance, please, uh, next time, do. OK, so we talked about manager challenges. Let's talk about employee challenges. Feeling misunderstood or undervalued. Yep, lots of nods in the room. Not knowing how to advocate for yourself or express your needs. This one I hear over and over again, that my boundaries are being crossed, but I don't know what to say. I don't want to get fired. And, and you know, when that job, that paycheck is essential to your, your daily living, it can be easy to just squash those needs aside and just keep working. <laughs> These are all ones, too. <laughs> Dis disconnection or tension amongst team members. So it can feel really awkward. 
you know, if you don't feel like you're valued or understood, not just by your supervisor, but also your peers, a lot of tension. And feeling overwhelmed by your to-do list and maybe resentful of work, even in a job that you love. Who's ever felt that before, any of these? Yeah. So these are happening even with well-meaning, big-hearted managers who value employee well-being. So it's, it's not that we are, are you know, just going out there being jerks to people and these things happen. These things happen naturally because we're missing something. And I'm sorry to start on such a low note, but I also want to normalize these things. If you felt any guilt or shame because you, you related to some of these, especially maybe more the manager challenges, I want you to know that that's okay. It's common, and we're doing the work here today to start to overturn that. So what is missing? Any guesses? Yes, in the back. Well, in my instance, you know, working at a startup, we didn't prioritize HR, so we never had an HR department. And so in my situation, I was really low on both sides of being a manager, and as an employee, there was nowhere to go to except the CEO, and that wasn't the same place. Mm. And so I think that's what's really hard, is that you, there's no prioritization of HR and those Right, right. And even once we get past the startup phase, you're still trying to grow and push and bottom line, you know, focus, and, and it's hard to bring it back to the people. And, and so sometimes we even, we skip that. There's a lot of small companies who don't have an HR person um, because it's, it doesn't feel like a necessity at the beginning when you're first starting. I think what's missing is trust. Uh, employees don't necessarily trust that, like someone else mentioned, that if they fail, it's okay to fail, and that there's still other opportunities. And then managers aren't trusting their employees to get the work done. They feel like they have to watch over every little detail. Yep. And, yep. Um, just that micromanagement. Yeah, trust is, is a huge one. And trust goes along with leadership, leadership skills. So from my perspective, what I believe is missing is leadership skills designed to support the equity for and inclusion of neuro, neurodivergent and invisibly disabled employees. And we'll get into the statistics on this, but it, it's really high. Uh, the, the people here. So according to Accenture and Disability In, disability inclusion champions achieve 28% higher revenue, double the net income, and 30% higher economic profit margins. They also achieve 90% higher retention rates and a 72% increase in employee productivity. So we can see just from the numbers right here, and I'm sorry, I don't remember what year this study was done, but within the last 10 years, this is a huge opportunity for us to start to really champion and include our, in, our disabled employees. Because not only is it just like the nice and smart thing to do and it, and it addresses all of these challenges that we met, have already talked about, but also your company is going to succeed. Your, your profits and your retention and you know, your growth in market share is going to increase when you focus on, on your people in these ways, specifically from this study. I'm sorry, came in a few minutes late. Sure. Did I miss the definition of, of disabled? What We're getting into that in just a minute. Nice. Thank you, thank you. If anyone's curious on the study source, come up to me after and I am happy to share that with you on any of the studies that I share today. So I want to take a moment and pause and reflect and ask, what has stood out to you the most so far? Mm -hmm. I know. So she said, how many people are talking about neurodivergent now? Um, I started this company just over a year ago and no one knew what it was. No one knew what neurodiversity was. There's now a Colorado Neurodiversity Chamber of Commerce with 
I think, 90 companies already in it. Uh, and it's about a year old. They just turned one year old. And yeah, it's really awesome. I love it, because now I don't have to explain every time I <laughs> say what I do. I just, people generally know what it is. I mean, I, I'll say that's not always the case. So if you're in this room and, and you haven't heard the term before, you are not alone by any means. It is becoming uh, more popular, though, of a topic. Do we have another one over here? OK, we'll move on. OK, so how do we define these things? What is neurodiversity and invisible disabilities? Is anyone he hearing one or both of these terms for the, for the first time today? Yeah, okay. Like I said, there, a lot of people ha um, haven't, don't talk about these things. So if you don't know it, you are not alone by any means. Okay, let's talk about neurodiversity. Neurodiversity is, if we, if we break the word apart, neuro means brain, diversity means the differences. So differences of the brain. Differences of the ways in which humans think, learn, and relate to others and to the world. And that is how we show up at work and how we work and do our jobs. An estimated 15 to 20 percent of the U.S. population is neurodistinct. And I like using the term neurodistinct over neurodivergent because neuro, cause divergent means to separate and distinct means kind of, you know, cool and different and, and there's nothing wrong with uh, being neurodistinct. It's just a different way that the brain works. So examples of that might be ADHD, autism, dyslexia, Tourette's syndrome, dyspraxia. This also can get into bipolar, anxiety, depression. An invisible disability has a lot of overlap with neurodiversity, so a lot of those things also fall into this category as well. That's more of a personal decision if you want to call yourself disabled or not. It's an ongoing physical or mental challenge that is not visible to an external party. An estimated 10% of the U.S. population has an invisible disability. So examples are migraines, brain injuries, depression, POTS, fibromyalgia, we can also get into diabetes, cancer, Lyme disease. A lot of this overlaps with chronic illness as well. So I want to ask a raise of hands. Do you know anyone who experiences one of these ways of being? Or are you yourself someone who experiences these ways of being? And you, and you don't have to you know, identify yourself if you don't want to, but can, can you raise those a little higher? Look around. That is almost everybody. That's just like, I can't, I have to stop hitting that thing. Um, that, that is just mind-boggling. These numbers here, I think they're probably actually higher than, than what studies show because the disclosure rates are low. So, we all almost, almost all of us, well, I'll, actually, I'll back up and I'll say all of us. All of us know someone, whether we know we know someone or not, who falls into one of these categories. So I'm grateful that you are all here to learn how we can support these people or better advocate for ourselves to be supported. So according to a 2017 study by the Center for Talent Innovation, among white collar college educated employees, 30% of them have a disability. And this, is, this study is getting a little bit old by now, but it's still you know, a high relevant number that is, you know, it's not just gonna go away in six years. The staggering thing is only 3.2% of these people self-identify to their employers. Of all the employees with a disability, 62% of them are invisible. So I'm willing to bet that of the 3.2% that it disclosed to their employer, most of them are likely visible disabilities because you, you can't get away with as easily not disclosing. So those who have invisible disabilities is likely less than a 3.2% self-disclosure rate. And I'm not saying this because I think that we need to increase that disclosure rate. People's business is their business. 
I don't think we need to increase that. But it's good to be aware that if you didn't raise your hand earlier saying, I, I don't know someone who fits this one of these categories, you probably do, and they just never told you. Statistics show that's likely the case. And, and those of us who did raise our hands, you probably know more people who fit those categories that you, weren't, you hadn't thought of because they never told you, and they maybe never will, and they don't have to. If we can support everyone as they are without asking personal questions, we don't ever need to know their medical diagnosis. It's not our business. So I want you to think back about who might uh, fit one of those categories that you, you thought about earlier of experiencing a, being neurodistinct or invisibly disabled or chronically ill and ask yourself what challenges might they or yourself, if, you're, if you feel comfortable sharing, Experience in the workplace. Yes. Keeping up with like, emails or Slack. Keeping up with emails or Slack. Can you tell me more? Uh, like the question is being able to use that as opposed to being able to connect with others. Thank you. Yeah, so dyslexia makes it difficult maybe to keep up with emails or Slack. Thank you for sharing. Yes. Um, it's funny because where I work, a lot of us suffer from migraines. Ah. And Very stimulating, yeah. it sounds like. So in an environment like that, it might be nice to have a quiet room to go take your you know, five minute break once an hour or something if, if your employer allows that. Something to reduce the stimulation. So I think one of the challenges is uh, the perception or not wanting to be treated differently or seen differently. Yeah. I'm a disabled veteran and I don't really, just to be transparent here, I don't like to offer that up because I don't, experienced being treated and looked at differently because I revealed that and mm -hmm. I just want to be like anyone else mm -hmm. we are all the time. Right. and so I think it's helped me be more empathetic because I think sometimes people do have invisible disabilities none of us know but all they're looking for is acceptance and you know doing a job working you know going about their, their lives thank you so much for sharing that and thank you for your service as well we yeah, we don't want to share. You know, it's no one else's business. You know, when people ask me what, this is Ziggy, by the way, I should have introduced him. When people ask me what he does, I'm, I answer, you know, because sometimes I don't want to, though. It's like, it's not your business why I have, you know, it's like asking someone, why, oh, why do you take that prescription medica medication? Like, well, that's not your business. But, you know, people are just curious. People love dogs. That's fine. I used to ask before I had one. I didn't really know that it was inappropriate, but that's a good example, and, and, and thank you for sharing yours as well, that um, we don't have to tell everybody else what our my medical diagnosis is or the reason why we need certain things or accommodations. And I also want you to think about if there's any parents in the room, do you ever wonder what the working world is gonna be like for your kid if they're neurodistinct or invisibly disabled? I think that's a, a kind of an easier way sometimes to look at it when you have that empathy for your child and you want the best for them. So for those of you who fit, that, fit these categories or if you know someone who does, I have a free support group every Wednesday, uh, fourth Wednesday of the month over the lunch hour from 12 to 1 for talking about our challenges together and, and being in a community where we really get each other so please scan the QR code. It'll bring up the registration page. You can fill it out later or send it to a friend and just keep it open on your browser. This is a, a, just a really supportive group of people that it just it feels good, it kind of warms my soul when we're all together and we get to understand each other. So you're all probably wondering by now, what's my experience here? How am I connected to hidden differences? And yes, I am going to share with you. It's, it's something that I, I share for the purposes of my business and, and growing awareness of these things. So I don't really mind sharing. I had my first traumatic brain injury when I was 15 years old. 
I was a sophomore in high school. I acquired convergence and sufficiency disorder, which is an eye muscle disorder, and post-concussion syndrome, which I still deal with today. And I'm 31, so 16 years later. So I experienced constant headaches, nausea, light and noise sensitivity, memory, attention, and anger issues. And you know, maybe the anger was part of puberty because it was around that time, I don't know. But it existed for a while. And that's how I, got, I found yoga. What happened was I failed out of high school English class because I literally could not read. I would read a sentence and have a headache for four hours. And I was told that I wouldn't go to college or graduate in four years if I did. And I refused to accept that, so I figured out how to make it work. And I managed to finish both undergraduate and graduate school earlier than my peers. And I like to joke and say I have an informal case study with my identical twin sister, who uh, I have pictures here with. She is, is the one, well actually, can anyone guess which one's me and which one's her? <laughs> the, yes, okay, not everyone gets that. I know it should be an easy question, but the one with the diplomas are me. Yeah, so um, I just like to showcase that we didn't, we didn't graduate at the same time, so we're not wearing our cap and gown at the same time, because I, I beat her. <laughs> If anyone else is a twin, you know it's always competition in life. <laughs> but the point is that, you know, it's, it's kind of fun to look back and see, like, what would my life maybe have been like if I didn't have those brain injuries? What skills did my TBI teach me? Any guesses? Persistence. Persistence. Resilience. Patience. Resilience. Another one in the back? Oh, you did. Okay. <laughs> Self-advocacy, yes, that's huge. Boundaries. Setting boundaries, which goes right along with self-advocacy, yeah. Yeah. Drawing other skills that were not uh, emphasized. Your other talents that weren't. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, bringing out my talents that weren't probably brought out as much before. Sorry, he keeps licking his leg, <laughs> trying to get him to stop. Okay, so these are a few that I came up with. Complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, time and energy management, communication, self-advocacy, resiliency, mindfulness, mind-body connection, and self-awareness. So these are all skills that you can imagine to be really beneficial in business, right? So in fact, in 2016, the World Economic Forum flagged key skills that would define success in the fourth industrial revolution. And the top three skills that they defined were complex problem solving, critical thinking, and creativity, all of which strongly align with neurodiversity and invisible disabilities. It's not just me. So what did that look like in the workplace? I utilized my new skill set to solve complex problems, think critically, and have positive relationships with my coworkers and my team. Then I experienced two more TBIs in 2018, back to back, six months apart. So in the workplace, I witnessed how confused everyone was, how to deal with me and my needs that weren't new to me, but I hid them before and I managed them on my own before. And then they came flooding back to the point where I had to miss a lot of work, short term disability, FMLA, all of that. And you know, I, everybody knew what was going on because I, was, I wasn't there. People were asking questions. So I felt really misunderstood and underappreciated for the effort I was putting in while experiencing all of these difficult symptoms. I needed regular breaks, a split shift schedule, which uh, from a job that was normally nine to five, I needed to split it into two, uh, two chunks throughout the day and take a two hour lunch break. I needed to have Ziggy with me for proprioceptive pressure, which means he presses against my, my body, uh, calms my nervous system down, and beha for behavior interruptance, which is he comes to me after I've been on the computer too long and tells me to take a break. And I felt that I needed to justify and explain my needs since what I was going through was invisible and you know, when there's an injury to the brain, no one else can see it. 
Even though ADA doesn't require me to justify or explain my needs, I felt like I needed to for the sake of my relationships at work. And the lack of emotional safety for me to share ultimately affected our team's culture, cohesion, and productivity. From a team that was, I loved, I loved working there beforehand and, and turned into this really tense place. So I'm wondering, have you ever felt confused about a coworker and not know how to help them? What kind of team dynamic did this create? Did someone say awkward? Awkward. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes it can create resentment within the team. Um, you know, it shouldn't. <laughs> it does. It tends to come out of resentment. Resentment, yeah. Especially if, in my case, and I think this probably happens with other people too. Well, it's different if you've, if, for other types of neurodiversity and visible disabilities, a lot of people are born with it. But when it's acquired, it's different. But for me, particularly, I was an overachiever. And I helped on everybody else's teams. And then afterwards, I could barely do my own job. I, I was not going to volunteer to help someone else's. So a lot of resentment. Well, you did this before. Why aren't you doing it now? Or you know, if that's not the case, if it's not acquired, maybe it's everybody else is contributing to everybody else's you know, team. Why aren't you? You had one? So what'd you do? I was trying to be nice about being like, you know, poor you or anything. I was just trying to be like, oh, you know, we're here for you. Is there anything we can do? That, that's all I felt like we could do at the moment. Yeah, try to support her the best way that you could. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing. So did anyone else experience, has anyone else experienced tension, discomfort, frustration in your team? not understanding someone else and not really knowing what to do about it. Yeah. So after five years in the workplace, <coughs> witnessing this confusion, frustration in my team, I began conducting interviews with other disabled professionals in my network and through the Brain Injury Alliance of Colorado. And I learned that this is prevalent in virtually every industry and organization. You know, we, we there's always going to be some time where we don't really understand someone else and, and it creates this tension. So there's a lot of neurodiversity recruitment efforts in some companies and organizations, especially in the tech industry. But what we're lacking is creating that culture within the team. Once we bring them on board, how do, how do we keep them there and support them fully? Or, in, or you know, in my case, when it, I was already there and something happened, so, you know, how, do you, how do you support someone after the recruitment process? So that's the piece that's really lacking. And according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the unemployment rate for disabled and chronically ill people is more than double that of non-disabled employees. So a lot of times we'll have an, an, an um, uncomfortable situation with our employer. We end up leaving for you know, their reason or ours. And then we're afraid to go back. And so we just stay unemployed for a long time. And, and the entrepreneur rate for neurodivergent people is really high too. I, I'm, I don't know a study on this one, but I'm guessing that's probably the reason for that too. Or it plays a role. A report to Harvard Business Review from the Return on Disability Group shared that although 90% of companies prioritize diversity, only 4% consider disability in those initiatives. 4%. And the statistics that we shared earlier shared that so the, the working professionals with disabilities have a 96% chance. So the 30% of employees that are disabled have a 96% chance that they're not in a culture that's, that directly celebrates and capitalizes on their unique differences. 
it's not just inclusion that we're missing here. We're, we're missing all of those skills that come with these, these differences that we had to overcome. And, and working in a world that's not designed for us helps us to create these amazing skills. So after spending a considerable amount of time researching this topic, I began to see how my unique experience in education could blend together to help companies create a more harmonious team culture and understand and, and bring acceptance and communication into their teams. So in, I just said that. So <laughs> um, create more inclusion, equity, communication in their teams. So I created a five pillar system to creating collaborative and productive work teams. So those are, the first one is leadership across the entire organization. Leadership is not just for managers. It is for everybody, it's for entry level employees, it's for interns, it's for janitors, it's for everybody. Strategic and kind communication. Hidden differences, inclusivity. Self-advocacy skills. These are skills that are necessary for everybody in an organization to communicate, regardless if you have an invisible disability or a neuro neurodistinct condition. Time and energy management skills. So energy management is huge. We like to push ourselves, push, push, push. And our energy is drained by the time we get home after work. There's nothing left to give for the rest of our, our, our life, our family, our, our, our work. Our, our life outside of work. There's nothing left to give when we are giving so much to our employer. If we have migraines all day, we're not pacing ourselves from all that, all that stimulation. So if you all have a, a phone or a notebook or something to, to, take, uh, to write down some thoughts, I wanna take a couple minutes to do a, a journaling exercise and think, if everyone in your team learned and embraced these five pillars, what kind of culture could you imagine that your team would have? We'll just take a couple of minutes. Take about one more minute.
as we're wrapping up our thoughts, would anyone like to share something they wrote? Yeah. Um, for me, self-advocacy really stuck out at my previous position. I tried to express my frustrations and insecurities with HR, and I was told to just keep proving myself and to not expect respect. Oh. So. Lovely. <laughs> I did not want to advocate for myself anymore. So yeah. that was the one that really stuck out to me is, you know, that there would have been on both sides the same understanding. Uh-huh. Do you hear that in the back? Yeah, okay. Wow, I'm sorry. <laughs> that does not sound enjoyable. Self-advocacy, it's hard when it's just you, but if we create a culture where everyone does it and it's the norm, it can really move some culture shifts. Yeah? I'd offer a modification of the report. That it's not self-advocacy, but it's the act of creating a culture where self-advocacy mm -hmm. is present, because Mm -hmm. Right, right. It's it's creating the, the norm, the, the cultural norm to self advocate that everybody does it because right when when just a few people do it, it's not going to work. So everyone really needs to learn these skills together. I think underlying a lot of these is a little bit of self awareness as well. Yes. Um, because I mean I've worked with people who should have been self advocating. And just created problems within the group. Mm -hmm. And because I have children that are similar, I, you know, I could recognize what it was, but they weren't willing to talk about it and therefore allow people to accommodate it. So what did you do? How did you support them? Uh, they, well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not at the company anymore, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Safety. Safety, yep. Yeah. I, I think so many, so many leaders probably have the um, unawareness of the root cause that is these invisible disabilities that, that cause the injury. And I think you would have a lot more employee safety if you were allowed to self-advocate for what your limitations are. Right, right. Employee safety. So are you referring to physical safety? Yeah. Somebody cutting themselves right. the right? What's that? What were you saying? Access, mm -hmm. we would have better access. Oh, can I say that again? The access, you said ac yeah. accessibility, accessibility, and he was saying creating physical safety. <laughs> if, if everyone in the company agreed to these principles, <coughs> it feels like there would be more like ownership of the culture. Like yes. Telling them the same, that people would feel more like they really wanted to create this. Ownership of the culture. So when we try to create a positive team culture with only two or three people trying to make that, sh that change and, and, and there's not buy-in from the rest of the team, it's not going to really make, it hap make the shifts happen that we're looking for. Is there one in the back? Yeah, Jesse. Uh. The energy management piece, one of the things I think about a lot um, and that we work really hard on is how do we push back the company against hustle culture? There's mm -hmm. this idea like we're at startup week. Startup week is all about, startups are about hustle culture, but how do you build that in at the beginning of burnout does not need to be a mode of life? Mm -hmm. And really building that, but that can't come from the top. That has to come from everywhere. Right. Because it's so ingrained in the way that we operate as a culture. Yeah, a lot of this has come from everywhere within and out, and um, so self-awareness goes right into hustle culture too, pacing ourselves, managing our energy, not pushing and, and, and giving into this idea that we need to overwork and burn ourselves out. Yeah. Uh, earlier I mentioned trust, and I think a better way of phrasing that is the psychological safety, so along yep. with the physical safety, like having that psychological safety of knowing that you can make mistakes, that you can advocate for yourself, and that people will be understanding and and be supportive in that as well. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So these are some other answers I've, I've received in the past. A psychologically safe and thriving environment, more retention, happier employees, more trust, open, free of judgment, 
ability to focus and collaborate on the task at hand. So that ability to focus is, is huge specifically for uh, the neurodistinct employees. Where unique is normal, I liked this one a lot, and people do not feel like they have to explain themselves. You, you fit in as you are. You belong as you are. Where you're celebrated for your contributions and not your process. I really like this one too. We all have different approaches to doing things and it's not the approach or the process that matters, but it's the out outcome. If we reach the outcome, then who cares what the process was? Where work feels like community and not a place where you have to, to change who you are to fit in. Yeah, this is really great. So I have a five part leadership training series that is designed for all employees of an organization, not those who are traditionally called leaders. Where we talk about these things, we have one workshop on each topic. We have leadership, communication, hidden differences, self-advocacy, and energy management. And along with that, there's a private online community where we continue to network with like-minded individuals in between sessions and beyond the program as well. There's optional add-ons for discussion groups and one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions if people want to dig deeper and really integrate this work into their daily work. I also have free resources, an inclusive communication checklist where you can audit your own communication practices in the workplace at my website, which is theworkingwell.us. And I want to share that for accommodation ideas and options and ADA support, if you have not yet heard of askjan.org, I encourage you to check it out. It's a free resource. They provide free support. Uh, free, I, I believe they'll do consultations for free. And you can just get a lot of ideas, whether you're an employee who's not sure what accommodations are appropriate to ask for, or if you're a manager and not sure what accommodations you're allowed to give or, or should be saying yes to in your organization. Here's a great resource to get some ideas. It's kind of an overwhelming website because it's got so much information on there. Um, but I encourage you all to look at it and just start, just brainstorm and just see what would I benefit from on this list. Maybe some employees would benefit from those as well. And again, I wanted to bring up my free monthly support group for those who identify as neurodistinct, invisibly disabled, or chronically ill. We also have caregiver, caregivers in that group as well. Um, there's a, a lot of work that, that is hidden you know, for them that they go through as well that we support. So we have some time for question and answers. If you would rather email me your question, the email is listed here, Jen with two N's at theworkingwell.us. And I would like to offer a complimentary consultation to anyone in this room. If you want to just ask more questions, see, does this really apply to my work? Can we, can we dig into this a little bit more? I'm curious and I just want to talk. Let's, let's talk and see. Um, so you can scan the QR code to schedule that and learn, learn more at my website as well, which is again listed theworkingwell.us. So what questions can I answer? Yes. So for your company, how do you market yourself to these other companies that, to learn about neurodivergency and visibility? What do you do to market yourself? How do I market myself was the question. By doing stuff like this. <laughs> this is my marketing. So I do, I, I, I try to speak as, as much as I can a couple times a month and as well as, as being involved with the Colorado Neurodiversity Chamber of Commerce that kind of flags all, and, and all the companies who are already interested in this stuff. So it's a great network. And I, I'm partnering with them to offer my program for their members right now. So um, that's how. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question is, how do I help remote employees who may not feel confident expressing their concerns, um, self-advocating essentially? So the, the principles are the same. 
for self-advocacy, to have open, honest conversation. First, getting being open and honest with yourself and figuring out what needs do you have, you know, would really, what things would help you thrive and survive in your work environment. And then um, encouraging remote employees, the same as, as you would with in-person employees, to have those conversations with their supervisors as well as coworkers if appropriate. Yes. So I'm very interested in this. Uh, how, what strategies would you have to recommend having this conversation with my so getting your supervisors on board with this if they're not here today uh, is a <laughs> you know that's like the next step if you want to move into this work so set a meeting up with with me and I can kind of coach you through how to have that conversation I also have an email template that you can send to your supervisor to start the conversation that includes things like what this is about, why it's important. I have a, also, I have a lot of resources for you if, if this is interesting to you and you want to kind of get the buy-in from your supervisor. I have a white paper that explains the what, so what, and now what of this topic. Yeah, Jesse. Um, shameless plugs for me on that. Um, if you want to know how to build some of these into your hiring process or get your bosses to build it into their hiring processes, mm -hmm. I'm doing a presentation on that on Wednesday. Oh. Jen is awesome. <laughs> Jen uses words like neurodivergent and inclusivity, inclusivity and all of that. And I don't. I think this is how you get better candidates. And so if you have a boss who is very like, no, I don't want all that inclusivity nonsense, great. Let's talk about how you can get better, more reliable candidates who think better. And it magically does a lot of these things. Yeah, um, that's so true. So yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. So Wednesday, 1030, in here? Uh, I think it's in here, yeah. Probably, if you're on the people track, yeah, in here. Um, Wednesday at 10.30, learn about recruitment and bringing these amazing employees into your workplace. What other questions can I answer? Bye, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I will stay here for, you know, as long as it takes, half hour, hour, if you want to come up and just Talk to me, talk my ear off, I'm here for you. And um, Ziggy will take some pets too. <laughs> I know everyone's always wondering. So um, yeah, thank you so much. Please email me. I, I will never try to push you into something if I don't think it's appropriate for your company. Um, but I just like meeting people and getting to know you. So, so please take me up on the consultation. I would love to get to know you.